thank you very much for your patience, for hanging in here to the end, and for listening to what I have to say. I'm, I'm, uh, I feel a little bit out to left field compared to everybody else, <laughs> but, uh, but they had to put me somewhere, right? So here I am. Um, <clears throat> the, the 1980s and 1990s um, saw the rise of very advanced traditional insurgencies in Latin America, basically following a Maoist model um, in places like El Salvador, Guatemala, Peru, and Colombia, all of these sponsored by either the Soviet Union or the Soviet Union's allies. Um, the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union saw the, dis uh, the disappearance of these insur insurgent sponsors and forced these groups to decide whether to negotiate or find alternate sources of funding. And so we see in places like El Salvador and Guatemala, they negotiated and ended their insurgencies. But Peru and Colombia turned to um, drug trafficking in particular as alternate sources of financing to keep these movements going. So these are really kind of the first narco insurgencies that now are very commonplace uh, throughout the world. Um, the problem was at the same time that, that the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union fell, uh, all of the previous authoritarian regimes in Latin America became democracies. And so although uh, drug trafficking allowed these different insurgencies to sustain their forces in the field almost indefinitely, they also had a very difficult time uh, gaining any type of, of, of political traction. traction. Um, the United States uh, supported Colombia to a great deal. We heard about, about Plan Colombia, in which I was in, uh, directly involved, uh, and Peru as well, to a lesser degree. Uh, and this assistance allowed, helped develop very advanced counterinsurgency strategies and security structures that basically neutralized these traditional insurgent organizations, despite their funding through drug trafficking. However, um, the, the, the far left, uh, the radical left decided to adapt. Let's see. Okay. Maoist insurgency theory, which I think is still relevant, and one of the reasons I think it's still relevant is, is if you look at Daesh manuals such as Surviving in the West, which is available online, um, you, even though they don't cite Mao, they very definitely understand and, and preach Mao through that manual. And I recommend it. It's actually one of the most advanced and and sophisticated manuals I've ever met, mentioned. So anyway, so please read Mao's theory if you're interested in insurgency because it's still relevant today, not only in Latin America but elsewhere. But Mao's insurgency theory mentions a principle that most students, get, in my opinion, get wrong or misunderstand. It is the concept that Mao talks about, about the combination of all forms of struggle or, as some people call it in English, the war of interlocking. Most people see the combination of all forms of struggle as a purely military uh, affair with different forms of, of military uh, tactics such as terrorism, guerrilla warfare, mobile warfare, and positional warfare occurring simultaneously. And while this is true, what it really refers to or refers to more broadly is all forms of struggle both military and non-military such as political struggle, economic struggle, informational struggle, et cetera, et cetera, occurring simultaneously, with the form predominating at any given time or place that best moves the revolutionary organization closest to taking power. In the past, such as during the Cold War, the military struggle has always predominated because either the nonviolent Polit arenas have, not, have been closed to the insurgent organization or the insurgents themselves have misunderstood their own doctrine and only looked at it as a military endeavor. This has allowed the West, and I basically refer to Israel, the United States, Europe, to develop a very advanced military-centric counterinsurgency uh, methodology that has been applied in many countries, such as El Salvador, where I served, Colombia, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. This classic military-centric insurgency strategy has not very worked very well in democratic states, even in weak democratic states, because the because the fact 
because that fact prevents massive recruitment to the rebel cause and justifies the massive intervention of foreign powers such as the United States. Okay, so how do you conduct an insurgency against a weak democracy without attracting the wrath and intervention of the United States or another foreign power? Enter the Bolivian cocaleros, what I call the Bolivian model. The Bolivians switched up the combination of all forms of struggle by making their principal form of struggle violent social protest, which is why most people have never heard that there was an insurgency in Bolivia. But what is the problem with social protest? There's a main weakness that happens with every social protest, and that is that in the end, people have to eat. And so you cannot sustain a social protest for more than about two weeks' time. We are seeing that in Venezuela. We keep on telling the Venezuelans to rise up and overthrow the Maludo government. They rise up, they last for about two weeks, and then they have to eat. So they have to go home and stop, and stop protesting. So how did the Bolivians overcome this problem. So the second plank of the Bolivian insurgency was the permanent financing of social protests through drug trafficking. They solved their problem of having to eat. In this way, social protests could be, could be sustained indefinitely and they could mobilize a permanent force of professional protest cadre. Each coca growing village or community was assigned a levy of two to three people that would serve for 18 months, basically a type of military service. And during those 18 months, they would receive a salary from COCA proceeds, and they were guaranteed that their family would be taken care of while they were gone. This meant that the Bolivian government was under constant pressure from social protest movements that would block the roads, sabotage the infrastructure, and make life impossible for the rest of society. The third plank of the Bolivian model was an armed group, so violence was not totally uh, discarded. But that violent group had a very specific mission. It was not to attack the government, but rather to protect coca crops from government eradication efforts. In other words, protect the source of income that allowed the financing of their social protest movement. They also co conducted selected killings of people that were through particularly, um, what do you call it, particular obstacles to the, to the uh, advance of the insurgency and provoke government violence in the protests. They would have snipers that would suddenly fire and you know, scared soldiers would fire back and they would kill people that now were innocent d uh, deaths. The fourth plank of this insurgency was the creation of a formal political party that participated in legal politics to consolidate the concessions made by the government to the social protesters. In this manner, over a nine year period, the Cocaleros were able to eventually take La Paz in October of 2003, force the sitting president, the sitting democratically elected president to resign and the call for new elections uh, in an irregular period, which led to the victory of Evo Morales who since 2005 has been the president of Bolivia. It is important to understand this model to understand what is happening throughout Latin America. And I, and I think this is really important. If Mao's motto was that power came from the barrel of a gun, the new leftist model motto would be that power comes from the almighty illicit dollar. This model neutralizes our counterinsurgency military structures because how do you attack a social protest with the, 81st, the 82nd Airborne Division? All right? How do you do it? How do you send your military forces out to attack a bunch of protesters in the street? You can't do it. It makes it difficult to identify an enemy force because violence against drug eradication can be blamed and was blamed in the case of Bolivia on faceless drug traffickers. And any violence committed by the state becomes a political liability and a mobilization rally point for the anti-government forces. This model helps us understand what is going on in Colombia today.
The FARC never intended to give up their revolution with the peace process, which culminated in the signing of the peace agreement in late 2016. What's very interesting is they were actually very public about their intentions. It was published on the internet. On their, they had a web page called FARC Peace. Um, and when I brought this to the attention of both officials in Colombia and the United States, I wasn't the only one, basically I was dismissed, or they, they, these declarations were dismissed because they were seen, oh, that's purely propaganda that they have to say to, to keep up their morale. However, if there's one thing that I've learned in studying the FARC, and I've studied the FARC for the last 20, about 25 years, that the FARC never made declarations that they weren't serious about. Although, they might not have had the full capability to carry them out. What was going on with the FARC? They were getting hammered in the field by the military machine that we helped create under Plan Colombia. They were losing cadre and soldiers right and left, 20 and 30 at a time, that they were unable to respond to. And furthermore, they had no political space because they had abandoned that form of struggle uh, back in the early 90s when they broke relations with the Communist Party, which, was, which had been, always been affiliated with them since the beginning of the struggle in 1964. So the intent of the peace peace uh, agreement, in my view, was to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory and change up their combination of the forms of struggle. It was not a negotiation to become a peaceful political party like any other party in a normal democracy. So what did they want out of this? Uh, first, they were granted 10 non-competitive seats in the Colombian legislature, both in the House and Senate. This represents about 4% of the votes. Not enough to make a huge difference, but often enough to, to uh, represent a swing vote, or the ability to swing a vote. Second, the implementation of the 400-page peace process was so expensive that the Colombian government was never going to be able to implement it. It cost them, it would be costing them, at, at conservative estimates, about $10 billion a year, more than their wartime budget of $8 billion a year for their military. By not being able to fulfill the agreement, the FARC could blame its failure, which they have done just recently, on the government and use it as a rallying force for political mobilization. Third, about 20% of the FARC were ordered not to demobilize. Why? To continue earning money for the FARC through drug trafficking and illegal mining. Drug trafficking has gone from 64,000 hectares um, to currently around 220, 230,000 hectares since the signing of the peace agreement. Right? The FARC were supposed to help the government eradicate the coca, and we see the results. Okay. Why do they want this money? Because a poor political party is irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> now, there was a lot of fiction about how these dissidents were dissidents and how they were rebels and all this kind of stuff. But every insurgent movement that I've ever studied where there have been true dissidents, there's been the shedding of a lot of blood. There was exactly two deaths that resulted from the dissidents of the FARC. Okay? Not only that, but as part of the agreement, FARC was supposed to declare their assets and make these available to the government to repay victims. The, their declaration, first of all, is way, uh, way low from the, from the assets we estimate they have. And second of all, they say something which is absolutely ludicrous, which is that, oops, 60% of our assets fell into the hands of the dissidents, therefore they're not available for the government to use to repay victims. And not only that, but not a single drop, uh, drop of blood was shed over the fact that the dissidents took the 60% of the assets. Now, I read thousands and thousands of FARC interrogations over the last 20 years. And the FARC would kill you at the drop of a hat over 3 to $5 that went missing or that was stolen by a member of their organization. So they didn't kill anybody over losing 60% of the assets? I don't think so. Okay. Fourth. They called on people to begin social protest to, quote, win in the streets what they did not achieve in the negotiations. Social protest 
up until about five years ago was almost unheard of. I mean, it did happen in Colombia, but it was very rare. Today it is a daily event. Every day there's a social protest, there's and several social protests somewhere in Colombia. While not all the social protests are provoked by the FARC or the ELN, um, almost all of them have ELN and FARC elements infiltrated in them. And finally, uh, a strategic alliance was formed with the other insurgent group, which I have not talked about, called the ELN. And in essence, what I believe is essentially the FARC agreed to become the political wing of the insurgency, while the ELN uh, rejected the peace process and became the military wing of the insurgency. Now, let me go back. Backspace. Okay. Does it look, what does it look like? It kind of looks a lot like Bolivia. Now, let me, let me just kind of point this out. So your, your traditional insurgency is in the blue, which is very focused on the military aspect and the financial aspect, and not so much on the non-military things such as the political. And what these guys have done is they've taken the same concept, but they flipped it on its head. And now the main aspects are economic, right, and the social protests with violence taking <coughs> a minimal role. Okay? So they've adapted their model. They've adapted their model. Why? Because they were getting beaten. So what's going on with this video that came out just a couple of weeks ago where um, Ivan Marquez, one of the members of the Secretariat of the FARC, declared himself in, as a dissident and declared himself in rebellion against the peace process that had failed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a few months ago, the man standing next to him in the cafe, right, this guy named Jesus Santrich, was caught by an undercover agent of the DEA uh, making a drug deal with uh, the Mexican cartels, right? A clear, th these, these, both these men were actually negotiators in Havana of the peace agreement. So here, a prominent negotiator, uh, and part of the negotiations that FARC would give up drug trafficking was, was negotiating a deal, a drug trafficking deal, uh, with the Mexican cartels, clearly in violation of the agreement. And, um, and the, the leads, the, the evidence was pointing to these other men that are actually in the photo. This guy here um, is El Paisa. I don't remember his legal name. El Paisa was kind of like their special forces commander uh, and, and these other people as well. And so these people fled. Uh, they think this video is actually taken in Venezuela and announced themselves as dissidents against the, the peace process. So what does this do? Well, A, it takes pressure off of those who remained in Bogota to run the, the political arm of the FARC. B, it basically formalizes something that already existed, right? And C, uh, as part of their declaration, they said the, problem, the reason the peace process is failing is because the government has failed to um, fulfill their side of agreement, basically then you know, blaming the government for all the problems that are happening. So it, it kind of killed multiple, uh, stone, uh, multiple birds with, with a, a single stone and basically sets us up for whatever comes in the future, which I think will look a lot like, like Bolivia. Okay, um, I know my time's probably pretty short, right? Okay, so let me, but this is very important, so I wanted to get this out of the way. Uh, we have this little group in Paraguay, uh, they're involved in the drug trafficking and all that kind of stuff, and, I, and you can talk to me about that later, I've written about it. Um, this group, the Mapuche Separatists, uh, both in Argentina and, and Chile, is very interesting because they do everything short of killing people, right? And so they're in this category that's really difficult to define. Like, do you call them terrorists? Well, they haven't really killed anybody, so how do you call them terrorists? Um, they, they derail trains, they burn trucks, they destroy businesses, they destroy churches, uh, but, but everything short of killing people. One of the interesting things is one of their main sources of financing is actually the government of Chile. I don't know much, as much about Argentina. Uh, like the United States, they have reservations where if you're a member of the reservation, you get paid a certain amount every month to live, and this is the money they use to buy their weapons and, and cause their mayhem, so they're indirectly government financed. Um, anyway, enough about that. Let's talk about Venezuela for about two minutes, because I have only have two minutes. Why doesn't the Maduro regime fall? 
You know, we have sanctions, we have diplomatic isolation. Uh, we've done all the things that we did with, with Marcos in the Philippines, with Milosevic in, in, in Serbia, and many other tyrants around the world, and this regime doesn't fall. The main reason is because this government does not depend on the legal economy. This government depends on drug trafficking, illegal mining, and money laundering from other states, particularly Colombia. Um, that money allows them to, to entrench themselves, to maintain their policies, to create a crisis for everybody else, and to perpetuate more refugees, which then creates crisis for the neighbors. So you can't solve Venezuela without solving Colombia, in my opinion. Okay? They don't need the armed forces. Why not? Because they have created their own guerrillas not to attack the government, but to defend the government. Uh, they have these, these, these what they call colectivos, uh, little militias that run around shooting and killing people of the opposition um, and doing the, the work, but then nobody can blame them because they're not government officials, etc. And I think my time is basically out, but I do want to mention one of the strange things that's happened is this alliance between the far left and radical Islam, mostly Hezbollah, but not only Hezbollah. There's also elements of Al-Qaeda and... Um, and uh, even Daesh uh, in there, they're involved with these far left, far left governments. And I'm out of time. Thank you.